Welcome everyone to our webinar series, Aging Society in the Era of Pandemics, Approaches in Japan and in Canada. I'm Maya Fujiwara, the Director of Prince Takamado Japan Center for Teaching and Research at the University of Alberta. This is our fourth webinar in the series, and we are going to look at how to mobilize serious gains in this critical time. First of all, I'd like to thank Consul General Kobayashi and the staff of the Consul General of Japan in Calgary for this general support, which made this happen. And our two speakers, Professor Rockwell and Professor Matsukuma, and our moderator, Choshi Mir, for joining us. Thank you very much. This year started in the middle of the pandemic. And in Canada, over 19,000 people, and in Japan, over 5,000 people have lost their lives. Our thoughts are with them, their families, relatives, and friends. We began hearing about the positive news regarding the general use of vaccines and various applications of science and technology to this crisis. Today's speakers also contribute to the promotion of our health and well-being, exploring the way for motivation and engagement. Since its establishment, Prince Takamado Japan Center for Teaching and Research at the University of Alberta has been committed to the promotion of intellectual exchanges between Japan and Canada. This situation has made it difficult for us to interact in person and encourage student mobility between two countries, which are significant parts of our academic mandate. Our mission remains to create opportunities for international exchanges. Now I'm very honored to have Consul General Shigenobu Kobayashi, and I thank you very much for, to, for being with us today. And I would like to invite him to make his opening remarks. Good evening and good morning. Uh, well, thank you for joining us today's uh, webinar, the fourth installment of this series. Uh, we are now focusing today's uh, uh, well, serious games. The title is Mobilizing Serious Games Under the COVID-19. Well, the first, I would like to say thank you again for hosting this very valuable uh, webinar series uh, with Prince Takamado Japan Center for teaching and research. I, I appreciate for your, well, the dedication in this respect. I also, I would like to the, uh, give a big thank you for our expert in attendance today, the speakers. From Japan, the Professor the Hiroyuki, I think Matsuguma, uh, from the Department of Content and Creative Design at the Kyushu University, uh, who is also the director of CS Game Project. And also the, from Canada, my friend Jeffrey Lockwell uh, from the Department of Philosophy and Digital Humanity from the University of Alberta. He's also the director of the Cool Institute for Advanced Study. He's also a very important person for this uh, Prince Takamada Japan Center for teaching uh, research, I think. Well, it is uh, such a great pleasure uh, to have you both participating today to enable us uh, make an uh, international discussion about this mobilizing game to support the aiding society. As just, uh, well, the Dr. Uh, Aya Fujiwara mentioned, uh, now that it is a very difficult situation in the COVID-19. In this respect, in particular, we need to pay attention that to the elderly persons who are most affected. Now, however, the generally speaking, the games are for the younger or well children. The, and the, in, in general, the, uh, for instance, uh, well, don't play so many games, the read books. These are the phrases from the parent. However, I think, uh, well, if you listen to this uh, webinar, uh, this kind of serious game is not something like that. It's, uh, of course, uh, have a taste of the uh, entertainment, but also the, it uh, well, the, the contribute to the solution for the various, uh, well, the agendas in the education or healthcare or something like that. In particular, for the elderly people, the, well, health and the rehabilitation, the, those are the very important 
uh, I think in this kind of the uh, agenda, a digital game is a very, very important uh, and valuable, I think. I think today's discussion is very unique and uh, valuable and important. For me, when I was a student of the university, I learned a little bit the uh, theory of games, like uh, the dilemma of the prisoners. Those are theories are very important, but today's discussion will give us a more uh, kind of the sense of the entertainment and also the, the way to sol solve the, these various uh, difficult problems. So once again, thank you very much uh, for your speakers that join us today and also the, every other people, people that join us today of this discussion. Well, I think today's discussion was very, very fruitful. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Consul General uh, Kobayashi. And now I would like to introduce our moderator, Chelsea Meir. She's the PhD candidate at the University of Alberta. Thank Please. you so much, Aya. So um, first we'll be hearing from Dr. Hiroyuki Matsukuma. Um, as mentioned, Dr. Matsukuma is an associate professor in the Department of Content and Creative Design at Kyushu University, and also the director of the Serious Game Project. Um, welcome, Dr. Matsukuma. Good evening and good morning, everybody. So I'm, my name is Hiroyuki Matsukuma. Um, I'm the associate professor at Kyushu Universities. So uh, I consider it a great pleasure to have this opportunity to speak to you in uh, regard to uh, my research. My presentation theme is the a study of serious game for healthcare. Before uh, starting, uh, let me introduce myself shortly. Uh, my major is content design and I'm particularly focused on CG production. I'm also the ex executive director of an art competition named Asia Digital Art Award. Uh, if the participant uh, make the artworks, please join our award next year. Firstly, I'd like to briefly explain what Serious Game is. Then uh, I'll introduce the two games I developed and my uh, exercise club. To conclude, I'll talk about my activities amid COVID-19. Have you ever heard uh, of the term serious game? Serious game are digital games uh, designed to help solve uh, social problems. Also, there are various uh, social problems in our society. I especially focus my research on healthcare and for elderly. Here are some photos of clinic named Nagao Hospital. I have done a joint research with uh, this institution in the field of medical and healthcare for a year. Nagao Hospital has been activities uh, introducing uh, digital tools such as Nintendo Wii for the participants' rehabilitation and has a good environment for joint research to seek more comfortable methods of rehabilitation. So I have developed a couple of games in collaboration with Nago Hospital. And here are two representative games. This is Kiritsukun, which supports stand-up exercise. Stand-up, sit-down, stand-up, sit-down exercise. After a repeated discussion with Nago Hospital, we regarded that the targeted motion to be stand-up exercise in this game. Stand-up exercise is the core of all rehabilitation trainings and is also the basis of daily activities. Also, it's such an important exercise. The motion is monotonous and boring. Our goal was to change this monotonous exercise into the enjoyable one with the help of games. This is an overview of the game. When a player stands up, a tree grows. The player needs to stand up repeatedly to reach the goal. We use a device named Microsoft Kinect as a hardware along with a PC. The target player is the elderly. Now, please watch the demo movie for minutes. <laughs> I'll set stand up and sit down.
I have to say the most important point about my uh, games. So this game has the very cute voices, girls' voices, and these voices are my daughter's one. And after developing the game, we have concluded a verification experiment. The game was proved to be useful and safe for the patient. There are three evaluation items. One, uh, give the subject the mission to stand up as many as possible, and we check the number of times. And two, uh, judge by a subject. And three, check the vital sign of subjects and observation. These evaluations were conducted in three different conditions. Exercising alone with no game, exercise alone using game, and exercise with therapist with no game. There are 48 subjects in total. Here's the result, uh, the maximum number of the stand-up times in both at hospital and the daycare center representatively, uh, the high school or rather than another situations. And training using the game and the training with therapist have shown the similar result. The training with Kiriskun is also evaluated. It's safe enough under the uh, observation of the therapist. This is the second case study. I will give the brief introduction to the, this game, Locomode Baramingo. This game supporting the exercise in the one leg stand. The game was named Locomode Baramingo, and this game uh, offers exercise to strengthen legs to maintain balancing ability. Now please watch the demo movie. And we have uh, held a Rokomo exercise club uh, regularly on campus for the opportunity to have elderly use the game along with Kiritsukun and Rokomo de Baramiko. So as you imagine, elderly people in their 16th to 18th do not usually play games in Japan. So we are re uh, required to settle uh, a place to have them play digital games. We have held this club regularly for more than five years and have always received good review from the elderly. Surprisingly, uh, most of the uh, participants didn't drop out from the club and they were uh, quite happy to join it every time. However, the situation has changed due to the COVID-19. From here, I'll talk about what I have done uh, amid COVID-19. The uh, Rokomo Exercise Club was called off last March, and the daycare at Naga Hospital was uh, temporarily closed at last April. 
Currently, uh, patients commuting to the daycare center is possible, but the training environment is limited. Chance of the rehabilitation uh, are reduced. As a result, uh, we ended up uh, being able to provide adequate care to the elderly. Therefore, uh, we developed an iOS version of the game, Kiritsukun. Our ultimate goal is to give the opportunity the elderly to exercise moderately and communicate casually, even at their home. The content is basically the same as the PC version. iPhone can detect the player's movement by an accelerator. Hold iPhone with hand to play and stand up and sit down training. Uh, I'm uh, using this game. In my case, I play this game for my abs exercise with uh, like that. And the result of exercise are storing, stored in the cloud, and each player can check their own exercise history by uh, logging the website. The leaderboards and titles are shown motivational elements. So we have been experimenting with I, uh, the iOS version since last June. The details of the survey are as follows. Can elderly play iPhone game at home alone? And how long can they continue? And the participant is five persons. Uh, the main person is elderly A and B from Naga Hospital. One person is age is, uh, 65 years old, and the elderly B is 81 years old. And one more person is so a health fitness programmer from the local government health and uh, well, welfare center. And another one is the professor. He's my colleague. And his uh, major is the, uh, exercise psychology, and me, the five person. But unfortunately, the elderly B was hospitalized for another illness and stopped playing last September. And now we continue to play game with four people. And here uh, is our history uh, as of uh, January uh, 21st this, this year. So you can see that I am the worst player in all of us. Let me introduce some of the reasons why the elderly A has continued the game. He said that I don't want to lose uh, other players who are working hard. I feel good when I obtained a higher level title. The, this elderly A loves the title so much. And so I asked the therapist yesterday, so he will reach the top of the title in this week the God of Standing. Uh, we believe that uh, use and continue, continuation of the game by the elderly is expected to be possible. We would like to increase in uh, scale of the experiment, but it's difficult to find the proper uh, subject and the experimental uh, environment. Because many elderly uh, people in their 17s and 18s uh, don't have the smartphone or Wi-Fi at home. There are some of the issues that we need to address in the future. I plan to continue my research on using game to support healthcare. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Matsukuma. That was really interesting. Um, our next speaker is Dr. Jeffrey Rockwell. Dr. Rockwell is a professor of philosophy and the director of the Cool Institute for Advanced Study at the University of Alberta. Uh, welcome, Dr. Rockwell. Thank you. Um, I want to start with a contradiction, which is a contradiction right in the idea of serious games or games that have serious purposes like education or health. And I want to use this contradiction to try to unpack and understand some of the games that uh, we've been developing here at the University of Alberta. This contradiction is captured in uh, this quote from the sort of grandfather of game studies or ludology, Johann Huizinga who wrote the book Omo Ludens, or The Man Who Plays, back in 1938. And as you can see, he was pretty clear in his definition that play, at least, was something that shouldn't be serious. Uh, more contemporary writers, for example, this is a, an essay on Slate, have been even more sort of clear about the, the relationship between games and uh, serious uh, endeavors. And I rather like this quote here about 
Uh, educational games are like dumping Velveeta broccoli. You know, the Velveeta sort of covers the fact that they're really supposed to be good for you. So this is the challenge that I think that we're facing. And uh, the way I want to sort of tackle it is, is twofold. First, I want to just briefly give people a little overview of sort of the history of serious games uh, and the types of serious games. This is going to be very fast uh, and will supplement uh, what uh, Professor Matsukuma uh, presented. And then I'm going to talk about a series of projects that I've been involved at here at the University of Alberta and talk about the successes and failures and uh, the challenges that, that we've uh, faced with this. So you can sort of see the outline of what I'm going to do. So educational games have been around for a while. A very well-known game, the Oregon Trail, actually goes back to a text adventure version from 1971. This game puts you in a situation where you are the wagon leader of a group of settlers who are trying to cross and get to Oregon. And it's a way the game is designed to teach you about the realities of pioneer life back in 1847 and so on like that. Uh, and you can see this game continues to be redeveloped. You can see in the left, you can see the early text version, and then it was moved to Apple IIs and IBMs. It began to get graphics and it's now gotten uh, quite sophisticated. So this is a, a very well-known educational game. There are Canadian educational games. I, I say this just for our colleagues here in Canada. The Bitcasters combined with Telefilm Canada actually took Civilization Three. They took the engine and they built a version, a game called Historic Canada, the New World or the History Game Canada in which you, you can play either a native person, French settler or an Anglophone settler and you try to recreate or simulate what life was like in the settlement of and colonization of Canada with all the problems and challenges. Serious games don't only have to be educational. A fairly well-known game which takes a total of like one to five minutes to play is this game called September 12th. It's by somebody who's also a theorist of games, Gonzalo Frasca and a company News Gaming. As you can tell from the title, this game is an attempt to get you to think about September 11th and the American response to September 11th. What you do in the game is you can see a little uh, crosshairs is you're trying to get terrorists. You're sort of up in the sky and you're looking. And then when you see someone who looks like a terrorist, you hit a button, it launches a virtual missile and it takes a while before the missile hits. And then you can see, and what usually happens is you end up killing innocent people. And the point of the game is to make a political point about the nature of this sort of distant video game type war. I show here a book, uh, Persuasive Games. There's a whole genre of these serious games that, that try to put you in a position to think differently about the world around climate change, around politics and stuff like that. A classic form of serious game Game is, of course, Simulator. The Microsoft Flight Simulator is one of the oldest around, and it's a game that is still being developed and redeveloped for new platforms, and it goes back to 1977. Uh, and it's a fabulous example. My understanding is, is that you can use the Microsoft more current versions of the Flight Simulator along with the appropriate um, physical aids, you can actually use them to get uh, experience that will count towards certain um, types of flight certificates and so on like that. And so I think simulations are extremely important uh, as a form of um, serious game, but there are some types of serious games that people don't think of. And these are some of the ones that I'm particularly interested in. There's this type of game called an uh, augmented reality game. And augmented reality games, uh, in effect, take something that is happening anyway, and they add something to it. And you'll see that a number of the games that we've developed are, are, are locative geospatial versions of augmented reality games. This one here, I Love Bees from 2004 is a fairly famous one. You start the game going to a website, which looks like it's a nice, cute little website about somebody who loves bees. And then the website gets interrupted and you start getting messages. And then you have to go outside and try to get information. And this game was actually developed as an ad. It was developed as a way to promote uh, another game. I think it was a viral ma marketing for the game Halo 2. 
But this idea of augmented reality is something that uh, people have used in a number of different ways. Some of you may remember that movie, I think it's called The Game, in which uh, a brother buys a augmented reality game for his, his wealthy brother. The wealthy brother never knows if he's in a real situation or, or a game. And hence, uh, one of the best known books about augmented reality games uh, has the title, This Is Not a Game because part of what makes it a game is you don't actually know if you're in a game, um, which can be sort of uh, fun for, for various, uh, in various ways. So this is one type of game and I'll be, uh, you'll see some examples of what we've tried. There is then this idea of gamification. An obvious example of gamification that some of you may have heard about is chore wars. Nobody likes cleaning up around the house. Uh, I'm, I'm just like everyone else. I, I don't like it. So what you do is you turn cleaning up your house into a competition, if you will. And Chore Wars, it's still going now. You can go in, you can create an account, you identify the chores you have to do. And then what happens is you, you build a character and you get points and you, you, know, you get armor, just like any other game. So when you do the, your chores, you get more and more stuff. And there's a, a very well-known and very readable book called Reality is Broken by Jane McGonigal, in which she argues that gamification is going to be very important, and there's all sorts of ways of using it. In her case, she talks about how, I believe she had a bad concussion, and she used gamification, gamifying her exercise and her therapy as a way of slowly uh, recovering from that. To return to our question, I started with Huizinga as one of the, the famous names in uh, game studies. But another famous theoretician of sociology, uh, Roger Quelois, has a book in which he opens up the idea of game. And we can begin to see how serious games can exist, even with our sort of uh, an older idea of what games are. In particular, Calois points out that there's different types of games. I mean, if we ignore computer games, you know, we have competitive games, but we also have games of chance dice, monopoly, various card games. We have games of simulation that mimic the world. And of course, Microsoft Flight Simulator would be an example. And then we have games of vertigo, games that put you in a position where you, you can feel something that you might not be able to feel or might be too dangerous to feel. And there's a whole interesting genre of medical games looking at helping people overcome things like a fear of heights where you, you get in a simulation and, and, and so on like that. So it doesn't have to be, games don't have to be uh, the normal ideas of games. So now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna switch and, and talk about some of the experiments that we've been doing over the last 10, 15 years. Uh, these experiments in, in games uh, all predate the pandemic but I'm gonna talk a little bit about how I think these genres of games apply and how we can, uh, we can think about these games in this time of isolation. One game that we've done, which in some ways is a pretty standard simulation, uh, we built a simulation for teaching medical students about the ethics and the discourse of what happens when you're on a ward. We used Unity, so this is a game development engine. We, we built a first-person shooter. You get to walk around, you, you meet this doctor, and the doctor puts you into various uncomfortable positions, and, and you have to respond in different ways. And then at the very end of the game, it gives you a sort of summary. You chose not to wear a mask. In the very beginning, you, you may not notice, but you can go and actually get yourself a mask. You can actually get a second mask and give it to the doctor that you're following who has put you in this uncomfortable position where he's not wearing a mask, it sort of says, well, what, you know, here's what you did and here's what you should have been thinking. So the game is used in, uh, in a sort of interdisciplinary medical education course. It's a course that brings together nursing and medical students and so on like that. It's been quite well received and uh, we've got good evaluations. I will say one of the problems with this was it was very expensive to make. For one little module, we had to buy all sorts of 3D objects and so on like that, and then building the animations and building the 3D space and, and so on like that. Um, so it, it, it's a labor intensive and expensive process. A type of game that, we, that we're very fond of and that we've been playing, uh, doing a lot of development on is what I call locative games. 
or augmented reality games that you play out in the real world. You don't play at your computer at home. These are games that you play on your cell phone, you go out into the real world. And we've developed a whole series of these for different purposes. Uh, we started by actually using off the shelf software. One of the ones that we worked with was Foursquare, which was an early sort of uh, locative social media environment. So rather than building our own environment, we, we decided to see what we could do with existing ones. And we had a relationship with Foursquare. And this one we built White Avenue, for those of you who don't live in, in Edmonton, White Avenue is a place that a lot of people like to stroll along and there's lots of stores and gift stores and places to go in. Before Christmas, we worked with a lot of the different store owners to develop a game with various challenges to encourage people to get out uh, go to different stores, see what's available, enjoy enjoy the street, and enjoy being outside. Uh, because if you've been in Edmonton, you know that uh, we have a real problem with seasonal affective disorder, with people staying at home and not getting any exercise. There was a series of challenges where you, if you went into various stores, you can see on the map there, you can see which stores are participating. You would go in. We had these little hidden sort of kawaii characters. And if you saw them and took a picture or looked at them, you could answer questions and then win prizes and stuff like that. I will say uh, some of the good parts of this, some of the things that we learned um, uh, was that uh, for many people, this was a social experience. They did it with each other. The downside is it's, it's very hard to get locative games to work reliably. The Wi-Fi and even cell connections of people are, can be somewhat unpredictable and it can be difficult. Uh, we found it very difficult to attract players. Nobody wants to sit there downloading a game and messing around and so on like that when they're out on the street and, you know, they want to walk up and down. They want to go into stores and stuff like that. Uh, the business owners love the idea, but, but when we weren't getting a lot of traffic with it, uh, they liked it a little bit less. It was a semi-success. We took the same uh, idea and we expanded and we built our own authoring system and our own environment. We built it on top of uh, a technology called Layar. And in this one, it was actually a sort of treasure hunt. You'd hold your cell phone up, you'd scan around, you would see little characters, you'd move in on them. And then if you got close enough to a, a location, you would grab it and then it would ask you questions. And we built uh, this particular one here, Campus Mysteries, was, was an introduction to the University of Alberta. So people, new students, uh, had to sort of wander around the campus and learn about different locations. Uh, also learn about healthy eating. It was uh, We were showing them where they could get food, where the restaurants were, uh, learning about where the health center was and so on like that. Trying to encourage students to use all the facilities on campus. You could only grab these icons, these uh, floating uh, ghosts, if you will, by getting close enough uh, to them. So you had to physically walk around. And we included one of the things that was in Campus Mysteries uh, in, in 1918, when the pandemic hit uh, here in Alberta, one of the buildings, I think it's uh, Athabasca or Cinnaboya, uh, was actually became a ward. And uh, there's apparently a, a ghost there from one of the uh, students who died in, in, in that ward. And so we included historical information too that would connect people to the history of the campus and the different buildings. We took the same idea and Fort Edmonton Park is a historic area. It's got a number of streets with historic buildings and we built it with a whole sort of set of questions. You have to go into the buildings to answer the questions. The downside here was when we really discovered that if you don't have good cell coverage and people don't have data, they, they can't get the next question and then they get frustrated. The technology is not quite there, though I think both Apple and Google have now come out with, uh, uh, with APIs that allow you to build more reliable locative games. So it's something that we hope to return to. Finally, as part of this whole project, we actually built an authoring system because we became convinced that in some ways the most interesting thing was to give students the capacity or artists the capacity to build their own little stories into the neighborhoods. In particular, we were working with an artist who wanted to hang her art floating in uh, different parts of the city so that other people could come and sort of see an exhibition outside. And so we built an online web-based platform for, uh, for doing that. 
Now I'm going to talk about a different project. This is the project that has perhaps been the most successful and the most widely used. In most universities, at least in North America, there are hundreds of students every year have to learn how to write. Nobody seems to want to actually teach them how to write. It's uh, Nobody wants to teach the intro writing course and so on like that. So we worked with the writing studies group and we developed a gamification of writing, what we call the game of writing. So we built an environment and this can support cl uh, classes or sections of hundreds of students. It has been, it's been used by over a thousand students over the years. And what the environment allows you to do, it's got a number of different components here. Of course, the, the central component is where you do the writing, but there's all sorts of advice that you get for writing. Once you finish the writing, you can submit it to your TA, you can go to the online manual, you can take notes and so on like that. You could do this with Google Docs to a large extent. But we then have some really interesting features. We have some analytics, which are not really gamification, but you can sort of see a word cloud of what words you're using and so on like that and get and get a concordance and see how you're using different language something that was very important educationally was a whole commenting system because the pedagogical principle was that uh, you learn to write by commenting on your and editing your writing and other people's writing. So students would have to write something, then they would have to go read uh, their fellow students' essays and they would have to comment on them. And then the teaching assistants could, could star the good comments. So we're trying to get them, the students to be thinking about and working on their writing. But back to gamification, we had all sorts of sort of dashboards where you could see how far you were in the assignment, which assignment you were in. In an early version, we actually had a competitive version. You could brag about it. When you'd finished a particular assignment, you could go, nya, nya, I finished it before you did to other students. And then we had a brilliant uh, student from Korea who designed a whole series of badges. So depending, you know, if you were the first student to finish the assignment in your group, you got a badge. Uh, you got badges for all sorts of stuff and different amounts of points. And we had leaderboards. I will say the gamification was used. So we did a lot of analytics because the nice thing about this is that we could see what parts of the web application people were going to. So we could see people trying out the gamification and the analytics and stuff like that. But to be entirely honest, probably the main thing that people used was the commenting. And that ended up being used a lot more than the other things, which is actually pedagogically a good thing. It's also partly because they were given grades if they did comments, they had to comment on each other's stuff. So there's the best way to motivate students is, is usually grades. But the gamification was also being used in students. We had one student who said that, you know, as weird as it was, it was strangely satisfying and, and, and he enjoyed getting, uh, getting different types of badges and stuff like that. So I'm going to talk about two more uh, things, one last game and then something that's not quite a game but is related to COVID and is heading towards it. Probably the most successful game of all the ones that we've developed was a card game, a simple game that, you know, you can actually create this game with a bunch of pieces, with, with paper, scissors, and a pen. What we developed initially was what's called a game design game. So this was a game to get students thinking about how to design games, because one of the hypotheses that we developed was that, in fact, the way you learn from gaming is by designing games, by having to think about how, how do you simulate, how do you mimic a situation in a game type environment. It forces students to think about the formalization and how you would simplify a complex world situation into something that that is playable. The problem is, is that students are often very shy to, uh, to be creative about game design. So we designed a ridiculous game design game. So what happens is they get put in teams, they get handed a bunch of cards, and then they have to come up with a game. For example, they have to come up with an idea for a game where the who is coworkers and followers, or it might be aliens from space or whatever. The where of the game is public space. It lessens the anxiety of coming up with a game because you know it is constrained by these ridiculous who, where, when, and wild cards. And this has proven extremely successful. And we've actually adapted this game design game to a whole series of health situations, obesity, getting people to talk about obesity by giving them these sort of ridiculous constraints 
it frees them to talk about obesity. Uh, mental health issues is another situation where this has been used. Again, it relieves the anxiety of talking about yourself and the, the really serious things and liberates it. So this has been something that has been uh, applied in a number of different ways. I'm gonna end with a project that we're working on now. It's not a game but it's heading towards being a game. We've gotten a grant that I'm not allowed to talk about, but the point of this project is to look at how people are talking about COVID. So we have been grabbing political discourse and Twitter discourse and web pages. We've been scraping a lot of information about COVID in Alberta, and we have brought it together into various text analysis environments so that we can visualize it. And the goal is next to start building visualizations which we can return to Albertans. So Albertans can play with their own discourse. So it's not quite a game. The idea is to give people a way to visualize and reflect on how COVID is being talked about. I'm going to stop with this great quote from uh, our colleagues uh, here in Canada, de Castella and Jen Jensen, uh, who point out something that I think is in many ways an answer to the contradiction I started with. And that's that Games aren't just played. You don't learn only from the game itself. There are things that are talked about, they're read about, they're cheated, they're fantasized about, altered, they become models for everyday life. The serious aspects of games are much wider than the games themselves. And that's one of the ways that we're trying to think about uh, serious games. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for both of your presentations. Uh, they were really interesting. Um, I've got lots of questions and I'm sure you guys do too. So. Um, just a reminder to our viewers to post your comments and questions. Um, you can do that either in the chat or using the Q&A tool. So um, the first question I have um, is really about connecting, connecting this webinar back to the previous ones um, that we had before. So in the past webinars, we've been really exploring this idea of aging society in the era of pandemics. Um, seniors have been particularly affected, um, not only in terms of their vulnerability to infection, but also to the effects of social isolation. Um, what role do you think serious games can play in caring for seniors? Uh, as you said, that the current situation of the elderly is very serious. Uh, as I mentioned in my presentation, the opportunities for exercise are decreasing. The use of fitness gyms has been uh, restricted and healthcare events have been called off. In addition, the elderly themselves uh, are not going to out the avoiding crowded place for fear of infection. This is a problem not only for the, those who need rehabilitation, but also for healthy elderly people. As a result, the elderly have to stay at home and exercise by themselves. This is a very difficult, I think. This is why we believe that the games are effective because games are good at encouraging active and continuous activity alone. I believe that games are a useful tool uh, amid COVID-19 but there are some issues and need to be addressed. First of all, the elder people, they have almost no experience playing them. In fact, they would probably say that they don't want to play them. My club's participants were almost same like that. But uh, once they try it, play them, so they find it easy and fun. Males, uh, in particular, loves title and readables. I would like to change this situation in uh, society by talking about my words. And second one, this will be a request to game creators. Many game creators love game, so they try to make a complex game that they want to play. My lab student also uh, come up with such project at first. However, elderly people with no gaming experience cannot play complex game. The rules, operations, and uh, interface that elderly people need to understand 
should be as simple as possible. On the other hand, the passive elements such as image, the movie, and the sound are fine, just like game played by younger people. Of course, uh, if the goal of the game is to maintain health, the design should also make people want to exercise. And so serious game design uh, requires a lot of thought and hard work, but I hope that many good games will emerge uh, amid 19, uh, COVID-19. Thanks, that was really interesting to hear about um, some of your insights into designing specifically for seniors. Um, which is really interesting. Um, Jeffrey, did you have anything to add to that question? I think Professor Matsukuma has made a very important point about how we're always tempted to make games for ourselves. I know that that's a, a temptation I've not always uh, succeeded at overcoming. But I think there's a parallel point to be made, which is that in fact, uh, some seniors play games. They just, they're not what we call video games. My mother was an avid mm -hmm. bridge player. My mother-in-law plays Scrabble. There's a whole series mm -hmm. of games that we sort of forget about, about, car games, board games, and stuff like that. And these games often have uh, two values. You know, uh, one, they, they have a social aspect. Now, I know in the case of some of the elderly people, so this is, this is anecdotal, this is not based on research, but I know a lot of uh, uh, people who are now figuring out how to play Scrabble online even if it is uh, you know, a very simple website or just you know, sending emails with, you know, uh, well, not, not for Scrabble, but for chess. I know people who play chess by email and something like that. And uh, we're seeing some websites which are beginning to you know, mimic very simple, uh, me the mechanics are simple. They're not first person shooters or anything like that. Uh, and I think this is important for uh, cognitive and social purposes. So that I think is, is something that is, is important. The work that we were doing with locative games, I think is, it, it's, is also important, uh, perhaps more so in a cold place like, like Edmonton, but the idea was to get people out and, and to, make, uh, to give them information about their surroundings. And when we were designing those games, COVID was not a problem, but I think there is the potential to explore how, uh, again, locative games properly designed, uh, and especially ones which are audio games, which you just, you know, everything happens just to what you're listening to, can add a layer of sociability and can add a layer of information and cognitive challenge that make the spaces around you more interesting and help people uh, get out. So that would be a, a hypothesis. So I noticed there's an interesting question about luminosity and brain health and memory games and so like that. I think there's a very interesting question around games and cognitive, um, and, you know, I think a lot of elderly people are very concerned about their memory and cognitive abilities. The question from um, Heather Christie Burns was about um, games like luminosity. Um, where the games are, are sold as kind of brain health and memory improving games. Um, I have one of those games downloaded on my phone as well. Um, but um, Heather's point is that there's some literature that's um, skeptical about whether or not these games actually improve the player's outcomes, work just in the game itself, but not in the real world. So how skeptical should we be of these um, memory and brain improving games? I'm just gonna say we should be very skeptical. Uh, I remember when uh, for the Nintendo Wii, I think it was Brain Age, was sold, and it was sold as being based, research-based, but then I think there was uh, follow-up research that questioned that. I will say, however, though, you know, one question is whether or not it's actually helping with your memory, but a question I'd like to see answered is whether or not people are enjoying playing those games because e even if they aren't actually improving their memory, there may very well be a level to which this is a palliative, it, you know, that it, it, it reassures, it helps uh, people, um, you know, check their memory and, and think about their memory and talk about their memory and stuff like that. So it, it might have, it might have other network effects that, that we can look at. We actually had another question um, related to um, 
Professor Matsukuma's work, um, Ahmed Amir Saeed is asking about um, the qualifications for playing the games. He asks, um, I assume that the exercise cycles are not very hard and that the participants um, don't feel too exhausted, um, but are there any um, qualifications for the participants like age or health conditions um, for them to be able to play your games safely? I introduced my games, two games, stand up ex and sit down exercise and so balance game. About the stand up exercise game, and uh, all of the elderly can play in safety because the, the movement is very simple, stand up, sit down. And so if the, the healthy, the elderly people uh, play this game very hard, for example, 40 times every day. But so the, uh, the patient usually at the Nago uh, Hobbistar, 10 times, just only 10 times one day. Yeah, prayer can choice the level of the prey. Very mm -hmm. easy. And one uh, another the balancing game. Balancing game, game is a little bit uh, difficult to play because the player have to stand one leg. The usually in Naga hospitals, the patient cannot stand one leg. The balancing game is for the healthy elderly. About the condition of the players, Naga hospitals pay, uh, the therapist. Check patient, of course. At our circle club, exercise club, we check the vital sign before the training. We have to care the yeah, health uh, every time. That's interesting. And you mentioned in your presentation about having to do things like monitor vital signs when you're developing these games. Uh, a sort of follow-up question. I was curious, um, are these games available to, to purchase in North America? And how many players do you have? I hope to up uh, our the application to the App Store, mm. but so not yet, <laughs> because the, I, we have the, some the problem to copywriting. <laughs> mm, that's great. Just now, so the uh, people can download uh, just only the in this campus. Mm, I see. Jeffrey, you'd mentioned um, how labor intensive and how expensive these games can be to develop. Um, but actually, one of the most popular types of games um, in the past year of the pandemic have been board games. And I'm curious um, whether um, board games have ever been used as serious games or, or studied um, as a type of serious game. You also mentioned things like like chess or or crossword puzzles, like are, are serious games more of a, an approach to it or do you have to design them specifically to be that way? I think there's a whole renaissance of board games. I mean, it, it didn't just start with the pandemic, it predates it and uh, goes back to some of the, the this these new Euro games as they're sometimes called. And some of them are quite serious. There There is a game called Pandemic, which mm -hmm. is a collaborative game and it's it's really extraordinary it's it, it's a very interesting game and and there's a whole tradition not just with board games but some of you may remember your your gym teachers when you were kids of these collaborative games that you did outside where you know everyone had to push a big ball around the field and the idea was to to stop having competitive games and build collaborative games so there's a long tradition of this the pandemic game is i think uh, in some ways a serious game and it is also uh, fun and one of the projects we did is we actually adapted the game mechanic of pandemic is adaptable to various other things and you chelsea will be amused we we built a version of pandemic which was around learning about um, learning about the digital humanities and and conferences and having to solve uh, problems in groups and so on like that, which was designed mm -hmm. to sort of teach people about project management in the digital humanity. I very much think board games and card games. And one of the nice things about board games and card games is they're so much faster to build and prototype and try and, and to fix than than doing it online. Uh, obviously, to, to get really good artwork takes a, takes a ton of work, but you can quickly prototype and try stuff out, which is why when you look at game design courses, you often you often see people starting with uh, card games. Um, Hiroyuki, do you have any uh, comments on the use of, of board games or, or hands-on traditional games? 
I love the analog games using the card or the piece in my lab. So our students try to make the, uh, the serious game using the card, but not only card, card and the sensor and network, the player can play the CS game using the analog card and digital tools. I think the very good that combine the digital the good element and the analog good element. So very easy to use the analog game and so very useful by the digital one. In Japan, if you go into the arcades or the game centers, yeah. There are these games where you, you place cards on the yeah. board and it, it's a combination and you might be playing someone over the network. These yeah. fabulous, there, there's so much creativity there. Yeah. And uh, even like the Nintendo 3DS, they have cards, you lay it down and then through the 3DS, all of a sudden the card gets augmented. Uh, yeah. These lovely combinations of, yeah. of uh, hybrids. Uh, we had another another question from an audience member um, asking about uh, the future of, of serious games. Um, so the question is, um, what are some current trends you see in terms of um, specific demographics that might benefit from, from serious games? Well, I'm just going to say something I mentioned in my talk. I think as Google and Apple build the hooks into the operating systems for for cell phones, I think we will see a lot more locative games, games that uh, you might listen to or play on your cell phone. Um, imagine if you were listening, instead of listening to music on your cell phone as you're walking down a street, imagine that uh, you were getting commentary or something that is based on where you are. But that depends on the technology layer being really robust. So we've had tons of prototypes but it wasn't until Pokemon Go that we began to really see uh, these games uh, working reliably enough to, to be commercially viable. Once they become commercially viable, then the public in some sense is educated as to the mechanic. And then we can start building serious versions. When you have a, a generation who understand how these games work, then we can build serious versions that might be a guided tour of the temples of Kyoto or something like that. Professor Matsukuma, any comments on future trends for serious games? I think that uh, the COVID-19 uh, this, this situation uh, effect make a good effect uh, effective for serious game field because the people have to stay home and you know, very difficult to meet the other the people. This situation want to uh, good the serious game. So a lot of the game creator or the another the designer uh, try to make the uh, good serious game design, and we can get good games soon. That relates to another of my questions about um, how our perspective on gaming has changed because of the pandemic. Um, so in the past, um, gaming has gotten a lot of criticism and heat for promoting um, antisocial behaviors. So There's kind of the stereotype of the the gamer alone in the basement uh, in isolation. But has the pandemic given us a new perspective on gaming um, and its social benefits? I'm thinking as well about how games have been used for not just socializing, but for, for hosting events and, and things like that. I think it's been certain genres of games that have where we've seen, let's say, antisocial elements. And they're not even strictly antisocial. There's social patterns where people within the circle in some sense enjoy the particular weird culture that emerges and people outside are excluded and something like that. It's a very much a, a mixed bag. If we stay games as the important games as being the triple A shoot 'em up games, then there's been a lot of challenges around the discourse that surround those. And a lot of them are violent games and something like that. But if we open our mind to all sorts of things as being games from board games to, uh, Farmville or something like that. I think we see we see all sorts of patterns and it's no longer a clear, there isn't one thing left uh, that we could answer yes or no. There was a question in the chat, which I think sort of relates to about, about mental health. I think often the stereotype is that, you know, too much playing of games in the basement leads to mental health problems. But the research isn't that clear about that. In some ways, the kids who go into the basement in some ways might uh, be 
joining tribes in their own world world of warcraft you know they 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 could actually have quite an elaborate social life and now we're all in this situation where all of us have a social life that's built around the screen and screen mm-hmm. activities so in some ways that those people might be healthier because they've learned how to build social connections ar- uh, uh, around that uh, what i will say is i think it's going to be very important to study these effects, the mental health. And I'm gonna, add, I'm gonna say one thing that I think is a pattern that's happening is, and it has a good and a bad side. We can gather data on people when they're playing online games in a way mm-hmm. that we never could with board games or running around playing hide and seek. So there's a level of surveillance that is happening. Anyone who's playing an online game, these online games have all sorts of analytics going on and all sorts of surveillance. And that surveillance is obviously being used primarily to, to sell them better. And in Japan, they had the whole gacha can problem of, you know, they're really fine tuning ways of getting kids to spend far too much money. But the surveillance can also be used and it's being used by school boards and by researchers to identify people who may be struggling and may have mental health challenges, which raises a fascinating ethics problem. You know, let's say, with our game of writing, let's say we were tracking information and then feeding it to an AI that sort of said, oh, so-and-so over there, Chelsea, you know, from the stuff she's writing, we think maybe she's struggling with mental health problems right now. What would we do about that? You know, would it be ethical for us to contact you and say, hey, Chelsea, I think you're struggling with this. Would that be ethical? We've got a fascinating set of problems around data analytics, big data and surveillance. Yeah, and I like how you touched a bit on the nefarious side of of gamification because games, of course, have been used um, as well by employers to to track employee productivity and make sure their employees are getting enough steps in. But it raises a lot of questions about um, surveillance and how that can be kind of couched in these um, fun terms like play and, and such. Hiro Yuki um, Matsukuma, do you have any um, last uh, comments or responses to the to the question? Now I'm very uh, excited about the culture of esports. It has uh, the potential to expand the idea using the game for exercise and uh, the running. Japan is the logging behind efforts to promote esports. The other countries get excited. So Japanese also will follow suit. So I hope that the Canada will also get excited. Yeah, it, it feels like the possibilities of sports have just kind of exploded, especially in the past couple of years. But yeah, with esports and um, concerts taking place on Minecraft or poetry readings taking place in Animal Crossing, it's, it's really exciting. So um, Jeffrey, do you have any last uh, comments? I'm just uh, typing an answer to uh, David Ibsen has a has a question here about uh, uh, opportunity to interact with the Alberta pandemic game, and I, I I just was reminded of we we developed an idea for a game in which this was for U of A students in orientation, and the idea was is that the University of Calgary they were all zombies and the students were coming to Edmonton and 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 our students had to learn about the city and to prepare and get food and exercise all that sort of stuff so so that was our attempt to to sort of build an Alberta pandemic game but of course it was very biased very pro Edmonton thank you very much for such an insightful and interesting presentation and I'm not really a game person because I kind of win. Uh, in any sort of game, but I was very interested uh, in game after this presentation. And thank you very much, Consul General Kobayashi, for being with us today. And it was a great honor uh, to be with you. And uh, and thank you very much for everyone for joining us. Uh, it was such a pleasure uh, to have so many uh, audience, you know, so many people in the audience. So uh, PDJC will continue uh, hosting these webinars and trying to promote the intellectual engagement between Japan and Canada. So uh, please follow our website and PTJC, and also uh, we have an account on Facebook and Twitter. So thank you everybody and uh, have a very nice evening and a nice day. <laughs>